Thank you very much, Ethan. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so I'm going to uh, very briefly introduce a project that may make some sense alongside Lauren's presentation because some of the work that I was doing in this area um, also gave rise to the application that we made to, um, to the ESRC to fund Lauren's PhD with the Alzheimer's Society. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly um, about my research, if I can just get it going, um, looking at how people uh, work with various different voice technologies, um, including smart speakers, uh, especially in the clip that you're about to see, um, and how they adapt them to make their houses, their homes, the settings in which they uh, have to deal with their impairments and the various ways that, uh, that their houses are adapted, um, just to, to, to deal with everyday life um, and also to deal with everyday interactions. So in homes, we have our family members, care assistants, um, and those are the kinds of interactions I'm interested in looking at. Um, uh, I'll show you some data from a pilot study that looked at uh, 100 or so hours recorded by a disabled person and their care worker. Um, and their focus was on trying to understand how does their daily routine of getting up, breakfasting, interact with these devices and also how do their routines um, in, or how do their routines uh, occasionally come unstuck? Where are the problems and troubles that they might be able to find a way through by uh, looking at these kind of detailed video analyses? So I will show some of the methodology that Lauren was talking about, conversation analysis, discursive psychology. Um, and this is about looking at social interaction in real detail, not just talk, also gesture and shared activities. Um, and what you're going to see are uh, some transcripts, and I'll just give you a warning that the transcripts are a little technical, so they try and show you voice quality production and sometimes activity. So if we look at this introduction slide, uh, you'll see a little speech bubble with some uh, words in it, ah, wrong one. And uh, just to give you an example, the, the transcripts that you'll see in this presentation have this kind of annotation. So you'll see asterisks in closing uh, or delimiting a turn or some talk or an utterance, and that's creaky voice. So that's when people speak with a very creaky voice. And the degree symbols mean very quiet. Other things might be more obvious. Capital letters often mean loudness or underlines, and I hope you'll get the hang of it just by looking at it. So um, what I'm gonna show you to begin with is one instance of where things can go wrong with somebody, particularly somebody who may have uh, a cognitive impairment of some kind, trying to remember the name of their virtual assistant and not managing it very effectively. So I'll just play the video once and I'll break it down for you a little bit. So here we go. Uh, the things that you'll need to know to uh, just to understand what you're seeing here is that you're gonna see um, this uh, Ted here sitting with his uh, Amazon Echo device. You can see that um, at the front of the table and um, also his phone, which is an Apple iPhone. It's actually hidden behind this, uh, this secondary smart speaker, um, but you'll be able to see him addressing both of these virtual assistants here. I think you've got me confused with someone else. I don't know what that means. Alexa. If you like, I can search the web for... Hey Siri, I think you've got me confused with someone else. So, I don't expect that you will have got that the first time. Um, because these things happen very quickly. Interaction does. So I want you to watch it again. This time I want you to really look at where do Ted's eyes track? What's he looking at when he says the wake word Alexa? And I think what you'll see is that he's looking at his iPhone. And in fact, it's only later that his gaze shifts at line nine here when he says, ah, wrong one. His gaze shifts over to the Amazon Echo device. So we can see that he's addressed the wrong smart speaker. Here's the gaze shift. Hey Siri. I think you've got me confused with someone else. I don't know what that means. 
Alexa. If you like, I can search the web for. Hey Siri, I think you've got to be confused with someone else. Now, what's going wrong here? As an interaction analyst, we're used to looking at quite organized sequences of talk. People, although we sometimes think of conversation as very disorganized, actually organize their talk into very coherent sequences. They become initiated and then they get responses. So if we think about the first sequence here. Alexa. Alexa. It, it's simply a summons and a response. And in fact, the summons and response is successful because the wake light comes on and it's illustrated here by this blue line that shows you where the wake line is on during these bits of talk. But what happens here is because Alexa has been triggered and is then listening, when Ted then says, hey Siri in line 11, we get a second sequence. Hey Siri. I think you've got me confused with someone else. And here what we see is that both Siri and Alexa answer that summons. Of course, Alexa is not the intended recipient, but answers anyway. And then the confusion really begins because Siri then interprets Alexa's response as an, a command. So we have a third sequence. I think you've got me confused with someone else. I don't know what that means. Alexa. If you like, I can search the web for... So as you can see, poor old Ted is stuck in this conversation with parties who have no apparent awareness of who's the speaker, who's the recipient, who initiated the conversation, and we get a real mess. So I'll just tell you a couple of things about natural interaction, which might help to understand how do we actually deal with these situations in everyday talk? Well, we have a machinery called repair. This is how we deal with problems of speaking, hearing, and understanding and interaction. So um, if we have a look at this example, this is how do we deal with things where we've misheard, say, the name of a person in a turn. Here's a, a quick example. Oh, Sibby's sister had a baby boy. Who? Sibby's sister. Oh, really? Yeah. So if we've misheard somebody, we could say who in the second turn. So the speaker says a trouble source turn. The recipient says who, showing that there's been a problem showing also what kind of problem it is. It's a mishearing or a non-hearing or a misunderstanding of a person. And then we can repair that because the initial speaker can offer that solution. Smart speakers are very bad at doing repair. So there's one problem. A second is a little more complicated and I won't go into it, but it's essentially the fact that in talk, speakers and recipients are always switching roles. And we've got many ways, as Irving Goffman, one of the founders of the study of social interaction pointed out, of also embedding other characters in our talk. So a speaker can also report on what somebody else has said. So other speakers can kind of inhabit our talk. Similarly, hearers may not just be the official recipient, the person who we intend to speak to, but also overhearers, as Siri here is the overhearer of a summons to Alexa, or the other way around. So the question is, how do things actually happen in these settings where there's a lot of different potential speakers, hearers and recipients. And I'll just show you one example to close. This is a very elegant example, I think, of how the um, assistant or the personal assistant of Ted deals with a problem where Ted is struggling because of the sound, the, the quality of his voice to summon his smart speaker. I'll play it for you, but what I want you to notice is how Ted in line 11 issues a command to Alexa, which then his healthcare assistant redoes. So we have two unsuccessful summons, partially because there's a problem with Ted's voice. He can't take a drink and smooth his voice. So he gives up. I cut out 28 seconds. Then he redoes the command. She glances at him, sees that he's given up. And does it for him. So I hope that's given you a quick sense of the kind of areas that we're looking at, the kind of data that we're using and the kinds of results that may come from designing these systems with this kind of sophisticated use in mind. Thank you very much.